Cindy is doing. So I just wanted to point out the disappointing aspects. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John Grievenkamp, who's substituting for Jim Schwederling, who is sick today. And he'll talk about the optical engineering program. <clears throat> right. Uh, so first, welcome, everyone. Glad you were able to make it down. Um, sort of an interesting week, I guess, for travel, at least from some parts of the world. Um, so I'm here representing the optical engineering group of the faculty. And uh, I think historically the optical engineering group is, is the uh, sort of the basis of the college going back to the, to the 60s when, the, when, the, when the, actually then the center was formed, but now, now the College of Optical Sciences. Um, and I have a, a batch of slides here. Each faculty member gave me one slide. Um, and so it's going to be sort of a rush going through all of these. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to even try to give you much technical depth on any of the talks or any of the topics. Um, what I really want you to get out of this is sort of the breadth of the work that we're doing within optical engineering. Um, and then you can go and, and find the individual faculty members. Hopefully they'll be around during the, the Q&A session. It's this afternoon at 1 or thereabouts. Um, so you have a chance just to get a, at least hear the names and hear a little bit about what everybody's doing. Um, so the, the engineering, we, we sort of, I, I guess one of the things I would say about the engineering is that much of the work we're doing is systems related. So someone comes to us to, with a problem and we try to solve that problem by building a system, an optical system that solves it. Um, many of, much of the funding is coming from uh, well, there's some government funding, but there's a lot of industrial funding in, within, the, within the engineering group as well. And um, so I think you'll see, see this mix as we go through all of this. By the way, to, just in talking about the classroom, I, I teach the geometrical optics course, um, which when you get here in the fall, you will all be taking, because it's one of the core courses um, that's in our program. And we do it down here on the distance learning platform. Um, which actually have some benefits for you as well, because we record them. So if you need to be away for a, a lecture, the recordings are available to you as well to see. So you can make up you can make up classes a little more easily with the video than um, uh, you could otherwise. In addition, I don't think that the video really interrupts the flow at all. I tend to just forget about the cameras being there and actually use them as a resource. So it doesn't change the presentation going on in the class at all, in my opinion, when we're, when we're doing that. So don't worry about that either. It's, I think it's actually a, a good resource for you. Anyway, uh, optical engineering, that's the sphere we have in the lobby. Um, and I'm just going to go quickly through all the different faculty members and who have provided one slide. This is Tom Milster. And Tom's uh, work it evolves in, um, well, small things. So he's doing near-field optics, high-resolution imaging. A lot of this evolves from the work he did in, he has done and it continues to do in optical data storage. Um, one of the neat things they have is a computer-generated holography writing system where, the, where you can generate a, uh, a pattern and actually write it into a mask to do whatever uh, you need to do. And that's being used by a number of groups throughout the college. Yuzuru Takashima is an uh, optical engineer, optical designer, and his focus, um, no pun intended, is related uh, a lot to micro-optics and photonic applications of, of optics. So you see some of the things he's working on. Uh, some are going all the way up to just classical optical engineering, a wide field camera. Others are doing uh, micro-mirrors and nano-optic design. Um, but Bridging, sort of bridging between the, 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 the hardcore optical engineering and the more photonics related topics as well. Russell Chipman is our polarization expert. Actually, he's probably the world's polarization expert. Um, and he, he's listed a couple of different things that they're doing. One is integrating polarization effects into optical design software, the ray trace code that's used to design lenses and optical systems. So putting polarization effects into that is on the left. And the hardware they're doing is in polarization remote sensing, where they build a, a, an optical system that actually measures the polarization characteristics of the, of the scene. And they're doing that spatially, so you get point-by-point -point information, as well as spectrally, so what different wavelengths are going on. And so if those of you have done a little bit of polarization, uh, they're, do, they're measuring the Stokes, 
the Stokes uh, vectors, Stokes parameters of the uh, of the scene. Hong Wa is into 3D visualization. So her area is, well, a couple of things. One is head-mounted displays for um, virtual reality. And so the optics of that, designing those. And a lot of it going on to the interface between the software and the, and the user, so you get the right experience with this. Uh, so a lot of really good stuff and fun things are going on with, uh, with Hong's lab. Jose Sassion is our, our senior optical designer on the faculty. And so he's our, if you want, if you want to get to, he's our ray bender. Um, but he's into really exotic lens design types, um, um, making use of the optical design software and applying it to designing pretty crazy optical systems, um, all of which are meeting someone's specification. Ron Liang, um, I think his primary emphasis is biomedical imaging. So trying to take optical systems and apply them to surgery. To, um, so you're showing some guided image surgery so you can actually get overlays on top of the, of the patient to see what's going on or what to cut. He's also doing um, a lot of work in what's called freeform optics. And freeform optics is sort of the next generation of optical surface type. Okay. Now, many of you may not have thought about this, but the spheres are easy to make. You take two rocks, rub them together randomly, you get mating concave and convex spheres. Okay, so spheres are easy. They're easy to test as well because we make spherical wave fronts really easily. However, there's inherent aberrations or image quality loss by using spheres. So the next thing that was going on, put on that was either A spheres. You can think of those as conics or more general A spheres, but you see those all the time. If, you, if you've done any astronomy, you know that most telescopes have a parabolic primary mirror. So that's to correct the aberrations. Well, freeform optics have no symmetry whatsoever. And um, an example of a kind of freeform optic you might find is in a heads-up display where you're, you're actually looking out and you need a little mirror up here that's going to image uh, a little television set, a little LCD display. And you need a, a very unusual surface shape because so that would be an example of use of a freeform optic. So that's sort of the next generation of, of optical surfaces that are, that are, that's coming online. Um, this is my group. I do aspheric metrology, so we measure aspheres. And most of my work recently has been devoted towards testing of contact lenses and the human eye. So we're doing, applying interferometry, the interference of light, to that. And what we're doing, one of the systems we're, we're bringing online right now is a system that actually does interferometry of the cornea. Actually, interferometry of the tear film on your cornea. So you, know, you may know you all have tears, right? Um, and, but the tears... It's a fluid, so it moves during between blinks. So understanding how the tear film behaves, and the tear film is actually the primary optical surface because it has the biggest index of refraction difference between air and the tear film. If it's not the cornea, it's actually the tear film that's important. So I have a little mirror here, uh, excuse me, movie here, if I can, there we go. So this is a, a, a movie showing the height variations on so, someone's cornea, so those are, little streaks in the fluid. So what's the effect on vision of that? Uh, you'll see a blink. Did it? I'll run it again, but you'll see a blink. And um, then you'll see the tear film redistribute. Uh, you'll see the, any little particulates move. But this is down, measured in uh, sub-wavelength height accuracy, standard for interferometry. We have a, a, an exceedingly large group doing large optics fabrication, um, and this is Jim Burge. Um, and so both the fabrication as well as the testing of large optics for the large telescopes. We have a big collaboration between the Stewart Observatory Mirror Lab, the astronomy department, which is where they're making the eight meter mirrors, 8.3 meter mirrors, and I believe they're going on a tour of that tomorrow, correct? So you'll see these gigantic mirrors um, in the fabrication process. Uh, Jim Schweigerling, who is supposed to be here, um, is, does ophthalmic optics. 
and so one of the things he's been working out on are interocular lenses. Um, now, you guys aren't old enough to know about this, but as you get older, the crystalline lens in your eye stiffens, and your arms aren't long enough to read the papers that you have anymore. So you need reading glasses. And so what they're working on are interocular lenses that can change focal length. So you use the muscles in the eye to change the lens shape between accommodated and unaccommodated so that you can basically replace or augment the properties of the crystalline lens as you begin to experience or experience presbyopia. Uh, so hopefully by the time all you guys get to be in your early 40s, we'll have figured this one out. But that's, that's what's going on with that. Something else I just want to mention uh, really quickly is we like to, there's all sorts of little things that don't necessarily fit nicely in courses. So we've been establishing some other ways of presenting some of that work. One of it is just little practical optics workshops. We might have an afternoon or two where we talk about a particular topic so you can learn about that outside of the usual course um, environment um, to sort of to broaden your, your perspective and your, the things that you have, have, the, have access to. Um, I, don't, I think you've gone through courses already. Okay, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, and you probably, actually, you probably can't read any of it. Um, the, the usual course sequence for people who are on the optical engineering side, as a matter of fact, most of the, uh, the applied side as, as well, the three courses you will take in the first semester will be E&M, which is 501, geometrical optics, which is 502, and linear systems um, analysis, which is 512. And so those would be the three basic courses you would take in the first semester. You would probably supplement that under our, our, um, our program with an additional course. Uh, there's some options for that. Then in the second semester, this gets, we start getting a little more specific to what you're doing. Um, you would be taking uh, 503, which is aberrations in image quality. And uh, the other one would be interference and diffraction which is another very general course that we expect pretty much all of our students to have as they go through. Uh, so there's lots of courses. Uh, they're not all listed here, and, but um, advanced courses as well that, that go through, the, through the, uh, the bit. I would say one of the things that, that I like about the engineering faculty here is we have a large engineering faculty. This is a lot of folks, and we all teach different courses. And we've sort of become expert in teaching those courses. So you have a wide variety, wide perspective of different viewpoints on the field that you will get as you progress through the, through the program. So um, I'll be around at 1 o'clock to ask, ask any, answer any questions. Uh, so welcome. Hope you have a great couple of days down here. And I think the next speaker will be Jason Jones, who will talk about the quantum optics group. Yes, sir. Can we get a copy of this PowerPoint of all the different... I don't think there's any problem with that. I'll send it to... Uh, Just send it to me and we'll disseminate it. Uh, the one thing you'll notice is we do have a lot of courses, so you will not struggle to find something that interests you. Oh, John. need the microphone. John. Right. Just the have to excuse me, my voice is just about gone, but I think I can get through a 10 or 15 minute talk without losing it completely. So I also wanted to welcome you uh, uh, to the college, and it's great to see that you all came. I was on one of the members of the admissions committee, so I've heard a little bit about some of you, and it's great to see uh, that you can make it out here, and we certainly hope to see you back again in the fall. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the optical physics or the quantum optics uh, research groups that are um, here in the College of Optical Sciences. And as you probably already know, we have a, a very large breadth of uh, research programs within the college going from very fundamental science to very applied engineering projects. And I think that's really one of our strengths. And, I've, and my group personally has enjoyed a lot of collaborations across engineering and, and physics um, areas with other groups. So uh, I'll try and stay on time. This is just a list. I think I've included uh, most of the right folks here of some of the different research groups that we uh, loosely will categorize as optical physics. Um, so I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Jason Jones, and um, 
uh, my group. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about in just a moment. And let me just uh, start off by giving a slide or two and saying a few words about some of the other research groups. So within optical physics and the quantum optics area, we have also a wide variety of, of opportunities ranging from theoretical studies, fundamental studies, to slightly more applied uses of quantum optics and optical physics in experiments uh, and some applications. Uh, so let me just step through some of these names and give, uh, give a few words about them. And we'll be, most of us around this afternoon, to meet and talk with you more if you have questions. Uh, so I'll start with Professor Paul Yesen's group. Uh, this is actually an old slide. It's the only one I have for him at the moment. Uh, but Paul's group studies uh, quantum information and quantum control. Um, and so they want to look at a quantum system, for instance, and figure out if we're in a particular quantum state, first of all, what quantum state is it? And how can we efficiently evolve it to another quantum state? Uh, this is also a very useful key component for quantum computation, which is related to the type of research that they're interested in. And um, one of the physical platforms they use in their experiments is cesium atoms, called cold cesium atoms. So in order to utilize cesium atoms to store quantum information, they have to laser cool and trap them first. Right? So they take gas of cesium atoms, use lasers to cool them down to 10 microkelvin type temperatures. Uh, and then they store them, actually, in what they call an optical lattice. So we use, they use light to make sort of a lattice of potentials to store the individual cesium atoms in. So now they're isolated. They're not interacting and colliding with each other. And then they look at the ground state of cesium and the Zeeman sublevels of cesium. And they try and determine and put all these atoms in the same state and then coherently evolve it into another state. Uh, so that's one example of the projects they have and one of the platforms they use. They also have another project Instead of using laser-cooled cesium atoms in an optical lattice, they're using cesium atoms that are trapped around the evanescent field of a nanofiber. Um, so you can uh, certainly check out their group and their lab for more information on that. Um, we can go on and look at uh, uh, Brian Anderson's uh, group. So Brian's also an uh, experimental group. And rather than using cesium atoms, they use an atom with a very similar electronic structure, rubidium atoms. And they also laser cool rubidiums down uh, in this first step to 10 microkelvin temperatures. Uh, but for what they're doing, they need even colder atoms, right? So they co cool them down using a different method, uh, down to near absolute zero, to a point where all these atoms start to condense into a phase of matter known as, known as Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, which maybe some of you are aware of. And in that point, when the atoms get that cold, it behaves as one macroscopic quantum system. Right? So this is a very unique system. And they're using that as a platform to study, uh, among other things, uh, vortices. Right? So in this quantum fluid, now these vortices have certain um, uh, quantum properties that are a bit different than other fluids. And of course, there is a discrete amount of angular momentum that can be contained in these. So these vortex cores that are shown in this image uh, are quantized. And so they're using this to study things such as uh, the superfluidity and vortices and looking at can they generate control of vortices and study the interaction of these different vortex cores. Okay. And um, they have two labs uh, that I think will be open. And you can go around and, and chat with them more about what, what they're looking at. They also have a very nice collaborator uh, in New Zealand who does simulations of these systems. So it's a very nice um, uh, synergy between the experiments and the simulations. Uh, and now uh, a slide or two about Professor Galina Katrova's group. Um, in their group, <coughs> they're looking at Really, the, uh, when we say quantum optics, we use the term somewhat loosely. But they're really sort of the uh, hardcore quantum optics group, right? They're really looking at the quantum properties of light-matter interaction and the quantum properties of light. And they're using as a platform what they call the group the quantum nano-optics of semiconductors, right? So let's see. I guess I had to step through this. Uh, but rather than using rubidium or cesium atoms, they're using uh, different semiconductor structures. One example is a quantum dot, right? So their quantum dot would have a very large dipole moment and it has a fixed spatial position. And what happens when you get light confined to very, very small volumes, the quantum properties of that light, and in fact the interaction with the so-called vacuum field, right, uh, become more apparent. And so they're trying to look at and study the quantum properties of light-matter interaction, the quantum properties of light. In order to do that, they have to be able to build these type of structures and be able to engineer them to study those properties. And so they have a very nice facility of molecular beam epitaxy to grow uh, these quantum 
<coughs> semiconductor structures. And uh, I think their labs will be open today as well, and they can show you um, some more about that. So certainly talk with them. They're also uh, this is a, a newer slide here, but this is showing uh, on top of this quantum well that they've grown. Uh, they have these uh, indium, uh, little isolated indium islands on top of it. Right? And these become superconducting. They've already shown down at 3.3 degrees Kelvin. And they're going to study, for instance, the photon statistics of the light that's emitted in these type of structures, looking at how this superconducting structure on top of that can affect the properties of the light that's emitted from that. Um, so let's go back to my list here. Uh, other than my own, I don't have any other slides, so I'll just tell you about a few of the other groups. So we have a number of uh, uh, very good uh, theoretical and simulation groups uh, in this area as well. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Professor Rolf Bender uh, does theoretical studies of the semiconductor uh, optics. Uh, Professor Ewan Wright, uh, who I've collaborated quite a bit with, does theory and simulation of really nonlinear optical phenomena in general. He has a, a wider range of things that he can simulate and do theory on. Um, we have a system where we have a resonant optical cavity that uh, has a plasma inside of it. And this is a very bistable optical system. When the intensity is high, there's a phase shift from the plasma. When the intensity is low, there's no phase shift. And so uh, we've done a lot of simulations on that system uh, with Professor Ewan um, co-advising some students on that with us. Uh, likewise, the, uh, Ewan also works very closely with Professor Miro Kolasek and Professor Jerry Maloney. They also have uh, theoretical and simulation groups. Very, very good simulations of extreme nonlinear optical interactions are really some of the best in the world in simulating those interactions. And they also do simulations on different semiconductor structures in their interaction with light. Um, I have a, a, I've collaborated with them as well on a number of different projects. Uh, currently right now with uh, Professor Maloney's group, uh, they're trying to understand in a semiconductor laser system what's the shortest pulse duration that you can generate. What is it about the semiconductor structures that would ultimately limit the pulse durations? And so I'm helping run part of some of the experiments in that, and they're doing the simulations on the system so that we can relate uh, the theoretical studies to what we see in the lab. So you don't always get that. That's a very nice combination to have the theorists and the experimentalists uh, working on the same project, uh, even having the same meetings where we try and talk uh, the same language, which is, can always be a challenge. And then um, it's also free to go over, and we have uh, AMO colleagues over in the physics department. And we have a lot of students that can work seamlessly uh, in their programs as well. And we have physics students that can work in our groups as well, too. Uh, so Professor Alex Cronin and Arvinder Sandhu uh, have some uh, very nice labs that you could check out. Uh, Professor <coughs> Arvinder Sandhu I, I collaborated with a little bit. And he also works with very short pulse light matter interaction. Uh, so you can certainly look in the physics department uh, for interesting groups as well that overlap with us. So I will. Uh, use a little bit of the remaining time here to tell you more details about uh, my group in particular. Uh, so uh, we're interested in a lot of ultra-fast phenomena and also precision spectroscopy. And um, we have a range of projects uh, that go from, that have real uh, applied um, goals in the end, um, putting frequency combs on satellites, uh, detecting um, uh, uh, different uh, molecules that might be in the air to more fundamental studies of um, basic atoms and how it relates to fundamental theories, atoms and molecules. Uh, two projects I'll just briefly mention. <clears throat> One is uh, laser cooling and trapping of mercury atoms. Uh, we're setting this platform to serve for an optical atomic clock that would tick better than our current uh, definition of time based on the cesium transition. Right? There's a lot of activity in going from a cesium atomic clock to an atomic clock based on optical transitions. And we also have work on utilizing what we call a femtosecond frequency comb and extending it into the vacuum ultraviolet to do spectroscopy with a higher precision in the vacuum ultraviolet than we can do uh, currently. So this uh, nice colorful rainbow I always show in, in our slides because this is actually coherent light that can be generated very easily these days in the lab. It's a rainbow of light, but it's actually very coherent. If you looked very closely inside this spectrum, you would see discrete frequencies, like a bunch of CW lasers, right, that can be used for precision spectroscopy. And um, I can give you maybe a brief overview of what we mean by this frequency comb. The femtosecond frequency comb uh, is sort of a, the tool that we use in a lot of our experiments. And I'll give you a one-minute example of what that is. You may know that if you have a very short pulse in time, 
uh, you look at the spectrum of that short pulse, it's just given by the Fourier transform. So a short pulse in time gives you a very broad spectrum. Right? So if you have an extremely short pulse, maybe one optical cycle, you'll have a spectrum that looks like that rainbow. It can be very broad spectrally. Um, if you have a pair of pulses, a pair of identical pulses, what do you have? Well, each pulse has the same spectrum in this case, right? So now we just have duplicates of the spectrum. But each pulse has its own individual phase. If the pulses are identical, the only difference in their phase is due to this time delay. Okay? So due to that time delay, there's a difference in the phase, and now these two spectra interfere. So now we get these spectral interference fringes. Okay? So now if instead of a pair of pulses, we have an infinite train of pulses, these regions of constructive interference become more sharply defined, and they become like delta functions, or they look like single frequency lasers. Okay? It's completely analogous to diffraction off of a grating. Right? You look at the grating, you look in the far field, and that's related by a Fourier transform relationship. The more grooves of the grating that you illuminate, the higher the spectral resolution you have. So that's the same spatial analog to this. So that's the tool that we use. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, but the point is that within this coherent structure of light, uh, we actually have these individual frequency components. And we can use this to probe atoms and molecules and ions with a very high precision. Um, let's skip over a few things here. So some of the applications that we're looking at with these frequency combs, uh, one I already mentioned is sort of next generation atomic clocks based on optical transitions. So I've said this already, but this is a picture of our mercury um, vacuum chamber where we take uh, mercury. It's kind of interesting because it's a liquid at room temperature, unlike everything else. And we put a little droplet in there and we cool uh, from that vapor down uh, different isotopes of mercury down to uh, 40 microkelvin or so. And so we're doing studies to see um, how good of an optical clock that could make. There's more applied you know, uses for these frequency cones. One would be if you wanted to detect uh, what's in some gas cell or what's in the air, uh, monitoring type of applications. This is an example of where the broad frequency comb, unlike a CW laser, can detect different types of atoms and molecules simultaneously. Right? So this is a picture that we obtained with a frequency comb where we were able to see sort of the molecular fingerprint, all the different absorption features, and separate out concentrations of water, oxygen, NH3, and other molecules. So using one laser to detect multiple species uh, with a very high sensitivity. Another project that's just starting with um, uh, some collaborators in a local company and also with the National Lab uh, is to look at, well, what if we have a metal and we want to know what's the composition of that? We don't have it in the gas phase. So there's this whole field of um, uh, laser-induced plasmas where you take an ablation laser, create a little plasma, and then you probe it with the CW laser or you look at the emission from it. Right? Uh, so we're collaborating with folks that do this to use our broadband frequency comb to study the different molecules, ions, and atoms that might be formed and then recombined and to determine what the composition of that material is. Right? In particular, we want to look at uh, isotope shifts to determine if it's this isotope or that isotope of, of some material. And then the last thing I'll uh, just throw up here really quickly is that a lot of work has been doing uh, been done by a lot of different groups from the ultraviolet into the infrared with these frequency cones. But there's a lot of interesting science and transitions in the vacuum ultraviolet and the extreme ultraviolet that we don't have these precision laser sources. We have synchrotrons and other things, uh, but they don't have the high spectral resolution that these laser sources have. And of course you have to go to a very large facility. Uh, in particular, there's this uh, tantalizing transition in thorium that no one's been able to find. It's a nuclear transition, but it occurs around 160 nanometers. And it would be very interesting to see if that could be excited with light and if it could be turned into sort of a nuclear clock. Uh, so we have colleagues that have developed the a thorium doped crystal already. And if they're able to locate roughly where it is, uh, uh, the source that we're developing would be an ideal to, uh, tool to probe it with. So what we can do, well, this is our original laser frequency. This is a continuum that we can generate. These are very high harmonics of that laser that we generate in our lab from the black and ultraviolet all the way down below 50 nanometers or so. And the way we do it is called intercavity high harmonic generation. And if you stop by the lab, we can tell you more about it. But we take our frequency comb, we put it into this cavity, the gas jet, create an I a plasma as we ionize it here, and it generates high harmonics. And that's how we generate these frequency combs down in the vacuum ultraviolet. The physics of this source itself is very interesting, uh, but there's a lot of experiments we want to do with the source uh, in the near future. So I think that's my time, but I look forward to talking with you this afternoon. And please stop by the labs uh, and chat with any of these folks. So, thanks.
Um, not all of them are open, but a lot of professors will be in their offices, so you can go and talk to them, and they might individually go down to you with their labs. Um, did everyone get the lab hand up? Okay. Well, welcome, and um, we've been subjecting you to a lot of um, information, and I'm going to inflict more information on you, but I'm going to try, um, I added a few things just sitting in the audience. I decided to make things a little bit more palatable, maybe. Oops. And we'll see if it's working. Getting close. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So I'm, I'm here to talk about the photonics group. You know, we've got four different groups. Um, and I'm Charles Falco. These are pictures. You'll see these people in the, the hallways of um, very nice set of people. We all collaborate with each other. We all get along. We take um, go to lunch together, our students talk to each other. Um, and what I'm going to do is I've gotten, I've, I've got slides from everyone that I put together that are just really densely packed with information, incredibly densely packed with information. Um, so um, there's no way if you have a PhD in optical sciences and you've, you're the world's expert in optical sciences, you will comprehend everything I'm about to say. So, so don't feel bad when I go through this. What I'm going to do is, what I'm going to try to do is just give you a flavor of the kinds of things different people in photonics do. If you don't know, photonics is a sort of a brand new word we made up, um, I know, of order within the last decade. It used to be called optoelectronics, and people decided photonics sounded better, which combines photons with electronics, and we do useful things with photonics, or try to do useful things with photonics. So going through the, um, just as a brief overview, just to show you that people are very active, um, Stanley Powell's group is working on, well, polarization cameras, uh, patternable retarder and polarizers. And each of the people, Stanley has um, funding, I believe, now from DARPA and, uh, and other agencies. The students in his group get exposed to a variety of uh, micro uh, machining, MEMS uh, technology, making um, small patterns of various uh, electronic structures to do useful things. I think I have a second one of Stanley here. Um, an, a miniaturized mass spectrometer. The idea, just to pick on something, the idea being behind that is uh, mass uh, spectroscopy allows you to determine like there's, there's some kind of chemical compound, let's say, in the air. Well, mass spectrometers are really big, so you can't carry those with you everywhere to look for um, um, chemicals that shouldn't be present. So Stanley has minor miniaturized this by micro miniature um, machining, ion milling of um, silicon wafers to produce world-class um, micro-miniature spectrometers. So one could carry, if someone has uh, uh, you know, some toxic compound um, in this room, to be able to detect it. And you, obviously there's a whole variety of applications on a battlefield to look for nerve gas, in an airport to look to see if somebody's trying to smuggle something onto the plane, um, and uh, whether the, water pollution, to see if, if um, some company is polluting the air. So many applications of this particular thing. There isn't time to talk about everything. So I'll just say very active group in micro miniaturized photonics devices of various kinds. Um, Mahmoud Falahi, uh, high tunable, we like to use acronyms of, of, vixel, of vixels, of vertical emitting a cavity, something electric laser. Uh, 
There we go. Vertical. What's the E? External cavity. External cavity. Okay. So, um, and doing integrated optics, making vexels to, um, uh, for a variety of different kinds of applications. Uh, uh, Professor Falahi is on sabbatical this year, working at the National Science Foundation in a program officer, and will be back um, actually shortly. Um, ConQ is uh, doing a, a variety of things. One, uh, ultra-fast fiber laser research um, to try to make compact fiber lasers that are um, in the infrared with ultra-short um, uh, pulse lengths for a variety of applications. So in every case, um, I'm going to talk about at least, um, classically the photonics group is working on trying to apply optics and electronics to practical um, problems. Practical problems as well as impractical. Practical, if, um, if somebody makes something that makes the iPhone 12 better, I would say that's a practical application that really has broad impact. Things that have impact that are important is if you have some development that my lab does something that, say, Jason's lab makes use of, well, that stays within physics. And it's sort of not making it out into broader society. And we try to do both kinds of things. But we also especially like it when we impact iPhone 12s or whatever. Um, more of Con Q's, uh, he's uh, using his uh, laser system, the chlorophyll distribution in a leaf, uh, 3D image of a diatome, image of a mouse brain. I don't remember why he's imaging mice brains. But um, now that I see this, I've got to ask him. I forget why he's doing that. Um, uh, work that Professor Mansurapur and I are doing, uh, we're trying, uh, one of the things we've got is a joint research project uh, on um, transparent conductive coatings for one application is for solar applications. To remind you, a solar cell, the light hits the, um, the semiconductor, creates an electron hole pair because the um, photon uh, energy is strong enough to break electron hole pairs, to make them, to break them apart. If they're attracted to uh, electrical contacts, they, uh, power can be extracted from the device. A limitation of a solar cell is that this blue guy has to make it over here to an electrical contact without recombining, because if it recombines, uh, all is lost. So you have to make these um, contacts covering a fair amount of the surface area, and you're screening a fraction of your cell. Well, if instead you could put a transparent conductive electrode on top, a coating where all the photons went through, ideally, and it has good electrical contact, then uh, the entire surface can be covered with the transparent conductive coating. And so one of the things that the students in our group are working on, there's an optical micrograph of a silver copper film um, and you can kind of tell that most of the film is transparent and only some part the, under those hairs is um, covered. If you cover a optical sciences logo it looks clear and then measurements the classic material that one uses is indium tin oxide to make conductive coatings on touch screens. Indium is a uh, vanishing resource, so we'd like to replace indium, which is expensive and um, going away, um, with something cheap like copper. And here, uh, the indium tin oxide, and in some cases, we have made films that have higher transmission, more like it's through than indium tin oxide, and sheet resistance is important. You need to have something that has a low resistance measured in ohms per square. And so if we take this as a quality factor, in some cases we're doing better. So that's one thing that we're doing. Um, uh, Professor Mansurpur also does theoretical studies, getting a lot of, of, um, of uh, publicity from work he published fairly recently, where he found there's problems with the Lorentz uh, law of force. And there are problems and he has a solution. And I'll just go through this because, and Professor Mansurapur teaches the beginning 
um, E&M class for all you guys if you come. And he is an award-winning teacher. He's won award, teaching awards. Um, and he keeps telling me I should take um, his E&M class myself. I hated E&M more than any other class I took in graduate school. And uh, anyway. So um, he, uh, there's been a lot of publicity about this, a lot of positive publicity, a lot of interesting work with this. So it just occurred uh, to show that we do other things. It turns out just today, uh, a whole bunch of emails got exchanged with Russia, with St. Petersburg. And my passport, I'm carrying my passport with me because I need to get a visa to Russia. Um, uh, it tur it's uh, a problem because, not because of any kind of political issues with Russia, it's because Russians uh, believe in bureaucracy. I think if you looked up in the etymology of the word bureaucracy, it must come from some Russian word. And so um, we are in the process of now establishing a joint master's degree research program with uh, University of St. Petersburg and the Hermitage, the world's most comprehensive art museum, where we will exchange students, if people, our students, their students, exchange classes and develop a program, uh, have workshops here in the U.S. and in, in St. Petersburg to um, basically apply optical techniques to the conservation and the study of artworks. And here's, a, uh, actually, this is from a few years ago. That's me in studying a particular painting about which I'm only going to show you one brief thing. So that's me in the Hermitage, and I'm going to show you an infrared um, image of that painting in a second. And here is that painting in the visible. And there's, I'm not even going to talk about it much. Other, I could tell you many, many th features, but just sort of look underneath this woman's black uh, dress. If we look at this in the infrared, her black dress looks very different than his black whatever smock. And um, there's many things that are revealed in the infrared. So optical technology for understanding works of art is something that is not photonics, but is something that students, because of uh, the reputation of the Optical Sciences Center, students here uh, get exposed to because the Hermitage doesn't establish collaborations with every optical center in the world. It's with us. Um, uh, advanced optical networking, lots of people, starting from the basic optical and photonic components, one needs to have, it doesn't just take over the strictly electronic ways of processing data, make use of the unique uh, characteristics and capabilities of optics, and we have people, uh, Millerod, we never try to pronounce his last name. Um, um, his group is, uh, is trying to optimize optical networks. So a higher level, more electro, uh, electrical engineering um, uh, part of optical sciences, which is really important to understand. You heard from John Grievenkamp uh, last that one of the strengths of the Optical Sciences Center is the breadth of it, ranging from classical grinding mirrors to almost electrical engineering to uh, laser uh, attosecond science. It covers a, a very broad spectrum. So when a student comes, when they find something that uh, of interest to them, they're much more likely to find something of interest to them than going to a much more narrow program. Um, so, you know, lots of uh, optical spectrum analyzers and uh, studying the, the structure of optical transmission uh, modulating the signal, many, many aspects of uh, optimizing, making use of the, the uh, characteristics of a photon rather than just uh, simply trying to carry, to carry over one-to-one -one what we know about electronic devices. Um, Robert Norwood's group um, also works in here, electro-optical uh, polymers, some idea of recent publications. Uh, all the, the best publications, Applied Physics Letters, Optical Materials Express, uh, very um, active, very large research group studying um, photonics and trying to extend to silicon photonics. And modulators, uh, presumably uh, 132 uh, 
parts per million per volt um, is a good number. And uh, micro bubble resonator, a whole variety of, of optoelectronic uh, applications in uh, Professor Norwood's group. So many kinds of um, opportunities. Uh, Professor Nasser Pegambarian, um, his group, uh, I'm going to show you a variety of things. Optical switches, um, fiber optic modulators, uh, a complex network simulator uh, here, uh, 3D holographic telepresence. They've made holograms that are um, almost real time, almost 60 cycle. One of his students with uh, rewritable um, holograms, getting a hologram to um, in the blue is a difficult prospect. They've succeeded in doing that. And holographic traffic light in case, I don't know why holographic traffic light of his interest, but. Um, and um, you will have visited by now or will visit the, um, the Cyan. And they have collaborations with um, uh, making devices at Sandia National Lab, which is in Albuquerque, which is, for those of you who are not from the Southwest, it really is the next city over. Next city in one direction is Phoenix, next city in one direction is Los Angeles, and over here it's Albuquerque. So with that, I think I'm roughly on time. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions now or later. Uh, you should come here. Um, you'll be really happy you did. And it, you'll have a great career if you do. You've got lots of opportunities of various people to work with. And um, we would be very happy to have you. I'm not on the, the admissions committee this year. I've been on it in past years. People I know that are on the admissions committee are really pleased with the, the crop that are here. So just sign in blood before you leave. And we'll see you in um, August. Thanks. talk about the imaging group. Um, you have time later today to talk with each one of the core groups and then with the individual professors. Sure. Um, and so you'll be able to ask questions specifically to the various uh, professors in the research group. Um, and are there any questions right now before we continue? Okay. Right after this, we have pizza with our graduate students. So you can start getting the dirt on all of us. Um, hear the gossip. Welcome to all of the members of the imaging group. Um, you have seen lots of images already. Um, imaging, imaging is a, um, very much an interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary cross -disciplinary technique. And the imaging core group in the College of Op Optical Sciences is actually distributed with members that are exclusively in OPSI and those reaching out across campus in a variety of joint um, appointments with other departments notably the, the um, College of Medicine. And so there's a lot of activity, um, and this has a long history. And in fact, it goes back into um, the early 1980s when the, um, the notion first came into being. And it seems like an obvious idea right now, but it was absolutely revolutionary at the time um, that radiologists might one day want to look at computer screens to make diagnoses. They had worked with films for close to 100 years and uh, they could do things with films, hold them up, twist them, flip them, look at them this way, do other things. And there was no way that computing technology was ever going to give them the latitude of things um, that you could do. The, the College of Optical Sciences, together with the College of Medicine, formed one of the first groups to look at the practical um, 
the practicality of uh, the age of entering the age of digital, digital radiography, and that's where we are, of course. The rest is history. So I'm going to do mine a little bit differently. For one thing, I knew that all of these professors um, ahead of me were never going to be able to stay on schedule, and I don't want to keep you, uh, watch you hunger for pizza. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly here. <laughs> I'm just going to remind you that, you know, so what is imaging? How is that different from other things that you do with light? Well, it really is about mapping of an object to a detector in a way that preserves some sort of spatial information, right? It's encoding, and it could be a 2D object being mapped to a 2D detector, or a 3D object to a 2D detector, um, but it actually goes beyond that. It can, you can look at multiple attributes at once, so it can be an object that has a spatial distribution of the emission of light and also a polarization dependent, uh, and you might want to image all of that so that the dimensions are growing in imaging systems nowadays. Imaging as a core group um, is really defined not by creating images that are pleasing to the eye, but making images that convey scientific information and that you can extract scientific information from. And it takes a slightly different perspective. It takes a mathematical rigor um, in order to turn imaging into a truly scientific process. Um, the, the variety of applications going on um, in which there is grants available, um, funding that's present in the college right now, um, there's obviously a lot of emphasis on homeland security and threat detection, environmental monitoring, <laughs> machine vision and robotics is a huge area, um, consumer devices. So to follow up on the vision of the role of optical side graduates going on to great things, let me just give you a couple of examples. If you go, and I'll show you the first, um, the first image here in a second, because we'll move on to talk quickly about my biomedical properties. Um, biomedical imaging has moved from here. For if you really wanted to get internal imaging, um, this is, of course, a famous, I think it's a, yeah, it's a Rembrandt from 1630s. Believe it or not, this standard of care for the ultimate in, um, in internal imaging remained until the early 1970s. Right? It, we called it exploratory surgery back then. Um, if you had a pain that wasn't visible on planar x-rays, they had to go in. The first CT system came to Tucson, <coughs> right around 1974, I think, 1975, somewhere in there, right about the time I started high school. So for me, that seems like it's a very recent invention. For all of you guys, it seems like ancient history. But it's pretty remarkable to think that surgeons used to open you up and root around based on symptoms you had described and try to find something that looked wrong. Okay, we've entered, we've entered the modern era of cross-sectional imaging. Now, how to make improvements in cross-sectional imaging? <coughs> There, are, there is a ton of work being done, for example, in abdominal CT. Now, this is where x-ray images are shot from a lot of directions. There is a lot of processing, and then you reconstruct what the three-dimensional distribution of, of the absorption coefficient is. Um, lots of techniques are being developed and worked on right now to reduce the dose of x-rays required to acquire this. So there's big public health issues. So these are, you, could have, you could have said five, six, seven years ago, oh, these are pretty mature fields. There's not much to do. All of a sudden, concern about the dose has climbed into the public's eye. We're going to start all over again and figure out how to do these techniques better than before. If you build a new system to, to do um, internal imaging with CT or with MRI, and you take it to the FDA to get approval, the person who sits at the top of the division that evaluates your medical system to say, is this going to pass FDA muster, is an OPSI graduate named Kyle Myers, who was recently elected to the um, National Academy of Engineering. If you buy next the, your next uh, iPhone camera that Charlie mentioned, uh, you should know that the people involved at Apple in the development of the next generations of sensors and the image processing that they require are all OPSI graduates. The reason our graduates get these amazing positions is that we Im Im immerse people in the optics programs in very challenging projects. We challenge them to build systems, start from ground up, <coughs> Think big, we'll fund you well, we'll support you well, and we'll go on to build um, many, um, many, many types of interesting things that is um, a little bit beyond what we think most um, students have the opportunity to do in other institutions. We have a lot of cool tools available. I chose to just to show one or two. We have um, a pretty good investment in rapid prototyping technology. We've been doing plastics for about four or five years. I'll show you where that type of application, where that takes foot in a second. We're ju just now adding um, metal rapid prototyping. 
Um, Charlie mentioned electronics. We have investments in, in fantastic electronics laboratories. Um, and the capability is also to take any, part, any interest you have in technology development and really see them come to life in a, in a product or a um, device of some kind. There's some things you can do in imaging that are <coughs> a level of indirection. I'm going to show you one experiment. This is a camera that we invented in, in our group. It's called an iKid camera. Um, it stands for Intensified Quantum Imaging Device, and the intensified part is that there is indeed an inten image intensifier on the front. I think most of you know it's a device that has a photocathode on the entrance, and then there's that generates photoelectrons inside a vacuum space. They're accelerated across, and they hit a phosphor on the exit, so you get a little light in and a lot of light out. There's a gain process in there. That allows you to see single photons or down at the single photon level on this side turn into many, many photons on this side, those are easy to image. So I'm going to put a CMOS sensor running at a couple hundred frames a second on there. We're going, to, we're going to make some light over here. How are we going to do it? We're going to put a fluorine 18 source that creates gamma rays. They're 511 keV gamma rays, so pretty high energy. They're, they're what's used in positron emission tomography imaging. It corresponds, it's incidental, to the rest mass of the electron or the positron. And what I'm going to show you is probably the only time in your life you'll ever see real proof of um, that light, light, light really does arrive in little packets that we call photons. So if I run the camera slow, and this is at different distances across from the entrance face of the image intensifier, what you see down here looks a little bit like a flashlight with diminishing intensity shining from right to left. So why does the intensity diminish? Who can tell me that? So I'm shining gamma rays in from one side, and I get a lot I get a lot of light created on the side where they enter and less as it goes in. That's, that's a demonstration of Beer's law, right? So the probability of interaction is you get most of the interactions occur close to the entrance phase. As I start running the camera faster, what I start seeing is every one, a single one of these little dots is one gamma ray that interacted in this scintillator, generated a little burst of visible light, and we're now imaging that. So we're using imaging to image other photons, gamma ray photons. It's a fascinating technique. We've now turned this and used it for a whole variety of um, other types of things, not just uh, gamma rays, but x-rays, beta particles, alpha particles, etc. Other people in the imaging group are doing very, very clever things. They're saying, OK, we know that in conventional, in conventional systems, for example, if you go and you have a suspected lesion and the surgeon opens you up, he will take a biopsy sample from you, and then it goes off to a pathologist's laboratory. And they have to make a cut of tissue. It's an invasive procedure. Other people in the, in the imaging group have been saying, let's bring the microscope to the tissue instead. And so they work on developing very clever endoscopic systems where the surgeon could actually go in and scan around and look at the place of microscope essentially anywhere he wants to on the surface of the tissue while it's still alive and remains intact inside your body. And this is <coughs> done, of course, using um, clever optics to hook <coughs> a couple of light in and out out of fiber optic systems and very clever micro optics designs into things that can go into endoscopes that surgeons use in minimally invasive procedures. And here's a hand piece for an endoscope. And because we have the rapid prototyping capability, we can now build things in our laboratory that it used to take entire companies to engineer and do things out of. So we actually have built um, laparoscopes um, on the, using a rapid prototyping printing capability that surgeons have used on patients in the clinic here at the U of A Medicine Hospital. This is, in biomedical imaging, this is sort of the absolute pinnacle. To build a device that actually is used by a surgeon in a, um, in a surgical theater to do something of, that's a benefit to the surgeon, that's like the absolute pinnacle of achievement for biomedical imaging. Because you have crossed so many hurdles. Your device is sterile. It is foolproof. Um, the surgeon who has only minutes is happy with the efficiency of using the system. It's easy to use. It didn't break. The software doesn't crash. All of those things. So it's an absolutely spectacular achievement. When that happens, that's not so easy. So you can see then, looking at, for example, so what does it give the surgeon? So you can look at the texture. This, uh, these happen to be ov ovarian um, patients with, at high risk for ovarian cancer. So they look down on the textures of the, of the surface tissues of the ovary, and the surgeon can make a decision right there whether the patient is at high risk 
um, for having the early stages or, of um, the onset of ovarian cancer. Now, I said early on in the first slide that there is all properties of light can be used in imaging, all range of wavelengths, everything from the gamma rays at the very high energy end of the electromagnetic spectrum all the way down to radio waves, which is how the, how the signal ultimately gets in and out of um, um, MRI machines. You can use coherence. Optical coherence tomography um, is a depth measuring or depth sensor device. So it measures a, um, a depth profiles. And you can look down, for example, through the, through the levels of the skin or <coughs> to detect precancerous lesions. If you have a suspect mole, they can scan through it and look what's going on below the surface of the skin that you can't see and probe the cell structure down there, look for the signs of disorganization and other stages um, that occur in, in precancerous and cancerous condition. You can do this to do um, colonoscopy tile things where you spot a, a, a suspect lesion in a preclinical model or, or, or in a clinical application and are able to probe down into the tissue and really see what's going on underneath without taking the step of having to excise everything to have a look. So endoscopy is a big area. Um, obviously, there are a lot of, um, and I think I'm going to finish up. I've, I've already run over by a few minutes. This is only a quick touching of the things. I mentioned or applications threat detection. There are programs up there read in by, led by Matt Kopinski's laboratory and other members, other members of the imaging group. Uh, Mark Nyfield, electrical engineering. Amit Ashok, Clay Lei Peng, the, the list of people involved in the imaging is so long. I figured if I tried to do a list like, um, like Charlie, we'd never get through. So. I think I'll stop there and just tell you that there's amazing opportunities. There are so many people um, involved in imaging one way or another um, um, that you really have to come and take a look at the, at, the, um, at the research pages of each of the individual faculties directly to really get a good idea. But I'll open it up for any questions if anyone has them. Thank you very much. We're going to go upstairs now again. Testing your vigor.